Uh, good afternoon. My name is Mary Lewis. I teach history, the history of France and its former empire here at Harvard. And it's my pleasure to welcome you here today as your moderator for this event. And thank you so much for coming out on a very rainy, wet day. I'd like to thank the organizers of Worldwide Week at Harvard for asking the Center for European Studies to host this event. And also Valérie Foulon, the Consul General of France in Boston, for helping to coordinate it. Before introducing our honored speaker and our discussant, please be aware that this event is being recorded and will be archived on the Center for European Studies website. Please refrain from recording it yourselves or from taking any photographs or videos of the event. We are privileged today to welcome Gérard Arrault, Ambassador of France to the United States since September 2014. Monsieur Arrault has a distinguished career in the French Foreign Service, having previously served as the Director for Strategic Affairs, Security and Disarmament, the Ambassador of France to Israel, the Director General for Political Affairs and Security, and most recently before his ambassadorship, the permanent representative of France to the United Nations in New York from 2009 to 2014. In these positions, Monsieur Arrault developed an expertise in both Middle East affairs and security questions, serving as the chief French negotiator on the Iranian nuclear issue from 2006 to 2009, and at the United Nations Security Council, participating in debates on the Syrian and Ukrainian crises, and contributing to resolutions on Libya, Ivory Coast, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Mali, and the Central African Republic. In our contemporary moment, with the Middle East crisis still ongoing, the Iran nuclear issue reintroduced, the continued threat of nuclear proliferation presented by other states, such as North Korea, Conflicts in Africa, of which we have recently been reminded by such unfortunate incidents as the ambush in Niger, where, I might add, things might have been far worse for the US forces had it not been for the French military. Continued threats of terrorism, the unfinished question of European unity in the face of Euroscepticism and defection on the one hand, and an assertive Russia under Vladimir Putin on the other, not to mention, of course, climate change on a global scale. We are reminded in the face of these issues and many others of how important it is to have experienced and informed people in the foreign diplomatic corps of all democratic states. Monsieur Arrault exemplifies that value of experienced and informed international engagement. He is also a public intellectual. Not only does he have an engaged and engaging Twitter feed, which I recommend to all of you, <laughs> But he also writes essays much longer than 140 characters, with contributions most recently on the First World War, the Treaty of Versailles, and related topics in such esteemed publications as Commentaire and Esprit. Monsieur Arrault will speak to us today on the French President Emmanuel Macron's foreign policy. After Monsieur Arrault's reflections, Peter Hall, Krupp Foundation Professor of European Studies in the Government Department here at Harvard will offer some reflections in response, and then we'll open it to your questions. Please join me in welcoming to the Center for European Studies and to Harvard University, His Excellency, the French Ambassador to the United States, Gérard Arrault. Thank you, Mary. It's always moving to be called Excellency. You know, really, it's, uh, you know, when I was at the UN, we were 190 ambassadors, and they were calling each other Excellency. So it was a bit, uh, a bit surprising. You know, good morning, Excellency. How are you, Excellency? That's really great. No, um, actually, I'm going to 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 be I, I, to be sure to make a short introduction, so to allow uh, a, a real conversation uh, on on all the issues that you could raise. First, I want to explain to you, uh, in a sense, uh, what is Macron? You know, how can we have elected Emmanuel Macron? Uh, the, first, the first element that we should emphasize, and it's important because it's, in a sense, uh, it's unusual. Uh, we have the same political life in the US, in France, uh, in a sense, throughout the Western uh, democracies, which means that we are all facing the same rebellion of some of our citizens 
uh, which uh, who consider that their elites basically have not delivered. Uh, who consider that the political system uh, as it is, and the political system is quite different in the US or France or on the, on, on the UK, the political system has put them in, really they have suffered from the political, uh, the political system. And we have in France, like you have, ha you have had in, in this country, uh, it has led uh, to a shift uh, of a part, or a substantial part of our electorate to the far right or to the far left. I know that for, for the French, Sanders would be a moderate left, but I know that for, <laughs> for a lot of you Americans, is a Bolshevism. So uh, <laughs> let's call him far, uh, far left, because for a lot of, your, of Americans, he is uh, from the far left. So we have seen a, more or less the same, uh, the same shift in our political, uh, political system. The explanation, you know, you could have, you can have a long explanation. I'm sure, I'm, I think it's not by chance that we are facing more or less, uh, again, um, the same phenomenon that we have uh, known after the crisis of 1929, crisis of 2008, with the destabilizing effects of such a crisis on, the, on, on our society. But there are certainly other, other elements, uh, long-term uh, long elements. The difference that basically that uh, um, we have uh, in France, the difference in the in French, uh, what happened in France, comes uh, the, to the fact that Emmanuel Macron um, you know, really understood that there was a majority on the center. That basically, even if there was a shift to the right and a shift to the left, there were still in France, and I do think in America actually, uh, there is still a majority on the center. And he has succeeded to convince the left of the right and the right of the left that they were closer to each other than they were from the left and from the right. And, and he has campaigned in a populist way Emmanuel Macron has been a populist, uh, a populist politician, but on the centrist platform. And he has succeeded uh, to, to, make a, to have a majority uh, on, the, on the centrist uh, pro-European, uh, pro-business uh, platform. Uh, right now, I have, I have, uh, I've met several uh, senators in, 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 in Washington, D.C., who are coming and, and telling me, well, how did he do it? You know, how did he do it? You know, really basically thinking of the 2020 election. Mm. And, and I told them, I said, you know, basically I do consider that we, you, you have also in this country a centrist majority, but your primary system is forbidding you from running to the center. You know, really, you're obliged to go to the right, you're obliged to go to the left. And when you look at, at France, actually, the French, you know, have, are always late on the Americans. They are imitating you, you know, one century after you have, you have done something, and usually they don't choose the best way to imitate. So they have, <laughs> they have imitated your system of primaries. And the result was that the conservative party, the conservative candidate went, actually was obliged to go to the right. And the socialist, so, who is a social democrat candidate, was obliged also to go to the left, and which actually opened, you know, yes. really an avenue uh, for, uh, for Emmanuel Macron. Mm -hmm. So it's a revolution in a sense. It's a revolution because this guy, three years ago, nobody knew his name. And in our country, to be elected president, usually you have to be around for the last 30 years. <laughs> Uh, and, you know, th three years ago, nobody knew, uh, knew his name. It's a revolution because he has created a party and he got a, ma a large majority in the parliament. And today, 78% of the members of the French parliament have, are, for, are elected for the first time. 78% elected for the first time. Uh, we have actually 39% of the members of parliament are women. Uh, which is the highest, uh, really, uh, only Rwanda, I think, is, is, uh, is, uh, is ahead of, but they have different ways of electing people. Uh, so, so it's really something, really something new, uh, which, is, uh, which is happening in France. Um, I do hope that the president's majority will be successful, not because of a personal choice, but because it's the interest of my country. I don't know if, whether there will be, of course. So in political, in foreign political uh, Foreign policy, 
um, he has campaigned on the, on the pro-European platform. Mm -hmm. And that is very particular because, as you know, I was speaking, I was really referring to the, the parallels between our two countries. And uh, the rebellion in your country was basically against Washington, D.C. and Wall Street. In, in Europe, in France in particular, it was largely against the European Union as the symbol of bureaucracy, as the symbol of what we call ultra-liberalism and, 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 and so on. And, and in a way, all the other candidates, more or less, uh, were campaigning on either anti-European uh, platform or a Eurosceptic platform. Mm -hmm. He was the only one to be deliberately pro-EU, pro-European. Second element in this, uh, the foreign policy, uh, like in your country, was not a major issue uh, during the electoral campaign, you know. Basically, European Union, you may understand, in Europe is largely a domestic, uh, actually a domestic issue, considering the importance of the European Union in, in the life of our, of our societies. For the rest of the, of the of, of, for the other issues, uh, it was really uh, secondary during all, all the debates. So now, uh, the president is there, has been uh, really uh, in the Elysee Palace for five months, the majority, parliamentary majority for four months. So I think we can uh, distinguish, we can emphasize two elements in his foreign policy. The first one is Europe, the European Union. Uh, it's obviously, it will be uh, the core of his foreign policy, of his domestic, uh, domestic polit policy. You know, there was a, a saying in the European Union uh, which really came from, from Delors, the, the uh, president of the European Commission, saying that the European Union is like a, 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 a cycle when, when it doesn't move forward, it falls. And basically, it's more or less uh, what uh, Macron uh, uh, believes. He considered that the problem of the European Union the last 10 years was basically because there was not any more any momentum. And so he wants to recreate a momentum. So that's the reason that he has presented during a speech he has made at the, at the, at the Sorbonne, mm -hmm. actually uh, just one or two days after the German elections, and I will come back for, for, to that. Uh, he has made you know, a series of proposals uh, which basically and largely are a way of giving a new horizon to the European endeavor, saying we are not only here to manage what we have done, Actually, we can move forward. We could have, again, we could have common, uh, common uh, uh, projects, European common projects. But in a sense, uh, the most important part, and which will be the most difficult part for him, will be uh, the, the Eurozone. The Eurozone, uh, as we say in French, we are in the middle of the stream. The Eurozone, you have, an European, you have a, a monetary union, and you don't have a, a, an economic union. Basically, uh, the, dif the difference uh, uh, between uh, Greece and, and Germany is not worse or is not bigger than the difference between Alabama and Massachusetts. Oh, yeah. But basically, you don't know it, but actually, as Massachusetts taxpayers, a lot of your money is going to Alabama. <laughs> but you don't know it because you have a federal state and it's going through, federal, you know, through the federal funding. In Europe, we don't have federal funding. So the result is that every two years you announce, by the way, to the taxpayers, 80 billions of euros are going to be, are going to Greece, which politically, as you can guess, is, is not really very sustainable. So the idea is uh, that if we want to save the Eurozone, uh, we have to move forward and we have to move forward towards federal federalism, federal elements. Uh, we are not going to create the United States of, of, of Europe, but we need to have some federal elements in terms of a federal budget, a substantial mm -hmm. federal budget. For the moment, the budget is more or less, Europe, the EU budget is 1.2 or 1.3 percent of, of the EU GDP, but we have to move in the direction to have a more substantial budget with a minister, with a minister of finance, but beyond that, you need also, for instance, to have a real banking union. You know, what happened in 2010 with the Greek crisis, um, the solution was to tell the banks, sorry, sorry banks, you have lent this money to Greece, Greece 
can't pay back, that's your problem. The, but, the, but we couldn't do it for two reasons. The, the first one, it was 2010, and if we accepted a Greek default, there will be after that, you will have the problem with uh, Portugal, Ireland, and it was uh, really uh, a, a stampede, you know, a disaster. But the second element was that it would have meant also uh, uh, the bankruptcy of the banks, which were, by the way, mainly Amer uh, German and French. Uh, which means that the 80 billions or 90 billions of euros going, giving, given to the, to the Greeks and the, the German taxpayer and the French taxpayer be, believes it has been given to the Greeks was actually given to the banks, Frank and German. Uh, so it means that a banking, a real, if we had a real banking union, we wouldn't have this problem. We could say to the banks, it's your problem because we would have a, a systemic, a system, a systemic um, fund, fund which could prevent the collapse of the banking, of the European banking system. Mm. So there is a lot, there are a lot of, of potential move, moves forward. Some who are technical, other ones who are symbolic or political. And that's the, the challenge now for, for Emmanuel Macron. Because, uh, and it's a dual, it, it's a double challenge. First, to be frank, a lot of French voters are, have no special appetite for moving forward towards a more federal Europe. We are uh, facing in Europe, again, like you are facing here, a sort of nativist uh, rebellion. Really, people, you know, really clinging to national sovereignty or uh, to the, you know, to the, and on the right, on the right and on the left. You know, some, uh, you, at least for the French, you may know, but really in the last, the last days, the new majority came to the parliament and discovered which, which, what has been in the French parliament for the last decade, that there was the French flag and the European flag. And the far right and the far left, that's, that's really striking, really asked together that the European flag will, would be taken off, out of the French parliament. You know, really, so that, that's really, of course, uh, uh, symbols are all, uh, on one side are silly, symbolic fights are silly. Uh, as a diplomat, I hate fighting for, for principles and symbols. Uh, but uh, at the same time, they are really revealing a lot. So we have this nativism, and uh, so there is no special appetite, you know, really to tell the European, the French, you are going to give up some more sovereignty to, 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 to the European Union. And you have, of course, you have a German, uh, the German reluctance uh, to, because for the Germans, basically, they have the impression that they are asked uh, to pay for the, the pizza eaters of the South. <laughs> really, and it's hardly a joke because it's in these terms that it's described in, the, uh, in some German newspapers. So a lot will depend, uh, will depend on, on the majority, on the coalition, which will be uh, really... Uh, which is now negotiated in Berlin. There will be, as you know, the German system. There will be a coalition. But first, they have to negotiate a, con a compact. Uh, so it will take some weeks and maybe, maybe uh, uh, some months. So we could think that we will have a new German government with a, 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 a coalition compact at the end of the year. And after that, there will be a negotiation where we will we'll start. Uh, between the 27 and especially between France and Germany. And the question is how far the Germans will accept to go in terms of mutualization of uh, the financial instruments. Mutualization of the debt, I think it's not possible. Mm -hmm. You know, really to have an EU debt, I think it, maybe it's possible, but it will be extremely difficult because the German uh, taxpayer, the German voter, doesn't want to guarantee the debt of Greece, or Spain, or France. And, uh, but what is possible, because at the end, it will be a compromise. Of course, it will be a compromise. And at this stage, I don't know what will be, and nobody knows uh, what will be the result of this compromise. And, and whether, of course, everybody will say, uh, I, I got the day, I, really, I got what I wanted. Uh, after that, the question is, of course, is subs in substance, uh, what does it mean for the future of the European Union? Are we, have we left the middle of the stream in terms of, of the Eurozone? Because if we don't do it, if we don't find a, a solution, uh, 
it, it's unsustainable to live from an election to another election. Mm. You know, really, sooner or later, there will be a quote unquote, a bad election in the European Union. You know, it may be in Italy or it may be in Spain or suddenly a major country in the European in the Eurozone says, I want to leave the Eurozone and it may happen. So we have to make the, the, the Eurozone politically, economically, financially uh, sustainable. We have not yet, uh, we have not yet uh, reached this point and I think it will be the goal of the president, the president to do it. Second, and second element, uh, multilateralism. I think the, really the president very clearly since his election has emphasized um, what we consider to be a bit the DNA of the French diplomacy, uh, at least from the French point of view, <laughs> uh, which is a commitment to multilateralism. Um, and, and he has emphasized that. And in a sense, the Iranian crisis has been for him uh, 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 an opportunity to, to repeat uh, the French commitment to it, but mm. there will be also in terms of, of course, of the climate change. Uh, we do consider that um, for us, uh, the negotiation of the Paris Agreement in 2015 uh, is, is a sort of model uh, that we would want to, to follow. Uh, it was a sort of a model because we have been uh, really, uh, really uh, honest brokers. Uh, we have really listened to everybody. Uh, we, we have accepted the idea that one size doesn't fit all. We have accepted also the idea that each country uh, should, in a sense, decide for itself uh, once uh, it has uh, agreed to the need of fighting climate change. Uh, it would have been unfair and, in a sense, politically impossible uh, to impose a straight jacket on the economy of Burundi and the economy of Germany. It doesn't make sense. Uh, so what was important was to have the, the political commitment, and it was the first time that we had the political commitment, and not only the political commitment of the states, because uh, fighting climate change is changing a way of life. It's not top-down approach. You need the mobilization of everybody. We had also in Paris the cities, uh, the territories, but also the civil society, the big companies were there. So it was really, and that's in a sense, uh, the model that we, we, we consider uh, as uh, critical for the future. Uh, so we will have an, another summit uh, in December in Paris on climate change. Why a new summit? The problem is uh, one of the, uh, the, the goals of the, 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 the summit is to be able to mobilize $100 billion a year from 2020. And uh, uh, you can't ask uh, third world countries, I don't know if the third world still exists, but third world countries uh, to really to change their, 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 their way of producing or their, their, if you don't help them. So the idea is to mobilize $100 billion a year, uh, not only state aid, it has private, public, loan, grants, uh, and of course, as usual, the, fin the financial aspect is always the slowest uh, to move. So uh, we are, uh, the president wants to, to mobilize the financing, and that's the, the way why uh, he's mobilizing this, uh, he's holding this, uh, this summit. So commitment to multilateralism, he has expressed it very strongly at the, the, at the UN General Assembly, in his speech to the UN General uh, Assembly. Uh, and... Uh, uh, also, he wants to, and third element, I should say, uh, third uh, element in terms of, poli of, of um, foreign policy, it's, of course, the threat uh, that France is, is facing in terms of terrorism. You know, really, and that's something which is that no president and no French government uh, can't uh, simply... Uh, consider that it's a normal situation. Mm -hmm. It's not only a, a law enforcement uh, problem, and uh, actually uh, uh, it's, it is a law enforcement problem, but not only. And uh, so he, he is perfectly aware uh, that behind uh, uh, the, the terrorist uh, uh, threat, uh, there are political, there are economic, there are social issues. Uh, so it means, for instance, that uh, we are trying to build an alliance for the Sahel. You know, the Sahel region mm. is a place where uh, uh, 
we are fighting terrorism. 4,000 soldiers are deploying there, and it's where the, the, the American soldiers were killed. But it's not by chance that this, uh, these countries are basically more or less the poorest countries in, in, in Africa, that their population is doubling every 18 years, and that these countries are the first victims of desertification mm -hmm. because of climate change. So really, so trying, so again, this Alliance for the Sahel is trying to mobilize uh, uh, international aid uh, to serve as a clearing house so that it has some uh, effective, to, to make it more, uh, more, more effective. So uh, looking also for a political solution in Syria, um, basically, maybe uh, you can say that Assad is winning, maybe, you know, really. Uh, on, in a military sense, uh, it, it appears so. Um, but uh, a military victory of Assad wouldn't be uh, the, the uh, solution, uh, wouldn't really uh, lead to uh, a, a stable peace in, in Syria, wouldn't lead to the, the coming back of uh, five or six millions of refugees, and wouldn't really wouldn't help uh, getting a new uh, ISIS uh, in three or four years. Mm -hmm. So we are trying to convince, again, we are trying to convince uh, other, other countries, including especially the United States, <laughs> to take the leadership, so to engage politically. It's, uh, the question is not to bomb Assad. It's, the question is not to send soldiers there. It's simply to try to engage, to try to create a political momentum, to have a political solution, uh, a political transition, in, in, in Syria towards, uh, a reconcil towards a national reconciliation. So I do think, uh, it's, I do think that this president, uh, first, of course, uh, is limited uh, in, his, um, in his policy, first by the size of our country. We are a middle-range uh, power. Um, and by the in a sense, the acuteness of the problems that, 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 we, are, uh, that we are facing. He knows it. Uh, but that is, he has two convictions. The first one, as I've said, the European Union is the, our, our horizon, uh, and we have to, to move forward, because it, in a sense, is the, the only way to save the European Union. It's the only way to, to, to respond to the, 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 the populist and nationalist nationalistic wave that, that we see uh, in, in Europe, but also by out of a conviction that uh, we are more effective when we are together. And that uh, considering all the problems that, uh, that we, all the problems I was referring to, I don't see one problem that only the French or even only the Americans uh, could solve. We have to work together. Financing terrorism, you know, it's really obviously uh, it's a problem that we have really we have to to uh, to be together all the countries. Um, climate change, you know, really, but there are also other other problems beyond that, and uh, it's a pity that the Western democracy are not able simply to sit down and speak about it. You know, I'm speaking about, uh, for instance, uh, automation, artificial intelligence. What is the future of the of of our jobs? You know, yeah. in the in the industrial industrial countries. Uh, it's the same, you know, basically the, the hurricane is coming. Uh, basically, is coming in the US first. It will be in Europe in five years. So that we could discuss it. The trade, uh, for instance, free trade. You know, you know that you can't speak about free trade. You were speaking five years ago. And, you know, it's not because of the president of the United States. It's everywhere. In Europe, you know, uh, the far right and the far left. Uh, you know, are fighting uh, free trade. So we are speaking now of fair trade. But again, fair trade, what does it mean? What is the definition of fair trade? Why don't we sit together, Europeans and Americans, to discuss fair trade, to define the fair trade, you know? So there are a lot of issues uh, that it doesn't make sense. We consider it doesn't make sense uh, to try to solve them or, or, or in, on a national basis. And that, I think, it's, it's a very strong a uh, very strong belief uh, of the President Macron. Don't forget, he's 39 years old. Uh, he's the son of his generation, which unfortunately is not mine. <laughs> Thank you very much.
Thank you, Ambassador. Um, we turn now to Peter Hall, Corrupt Foundation Professor of European Studies, um, for a few um, remarks and response, and then we'll open it up to questions. Thanks very much, Mary, and thanks very much, uh, Ambassador Arno. Um, I think in some ways it's very appropriate that the um, ambassador of France to the U.S. at this moment should be a specialist on the Treaty of Versailles, and uh, <laughs> there may be ways in which um, uh, that is uh, useful. Uh, thanks very much in particular for your stimulating, your um, informal, candid remarks. I think um, this is exactly what the occasion had called for. Uh, and, and I'll say, uh, I'll be brief because I think other people will want to raise a bunch of issues. Um, uh, but uh, let me say a few things about the uh, core question with which you began, which is uh, what is uh, Macron? A, a question that uh, people are asking all over the world and, uh, um, and, and much to the credit of France, I think, for that reason. So I, I want to say, I'll say something uh, very much in line with your remarks about um, uh, the aspirations of uh, the French Republic under Emmanuel Macron is um, very much in line with what you said. Uh, and then a, a brief word about the challenges, I think, uh, facing those aspirations. And um, in honor of the occasion, I'll make three points under uh, each of those headings. <laughs> uh, very French. Uh, and uh, I take uh, <laughs> in, uh, um, not uh, <laughs> not unintentionally. Um, and, and like you, I will, um, in some sense, take off from this uh, quite remarkable speech that the president gave at the Sorbonne a little over a month ago, which I recommend to all of you. Um, I wasn't actually looking forward to reading it because it's long, but and, and it's in French, as you might imagine. But, um, <laughs> His speech is uh, always long. Yeah, but it's very it's really interesting. <laughs> I do recommend it to good. you. So aspirations. Um, uh, uh, my view of the aspirations of uh, the government are very much uh, uh, those that you mentioned, um, uh, and the president in particular. First of all, I think it's clear, you didn't quite say this, although you came close at the end, I think it's quite clear uh, that uh, Mr. Macron is making an explicit appeal to the new generation, younger generations, and he's making that appeal uh, on the basis of new technology. Uh, and uh, this, in many ways, uh, has uh, long been a winning political formula. It uh, certainly reminds me of the political formula of John F. Kennedy mm. in this country in my youth. Uh, it's also the political formula of Harold Wilson when he won uh, election in 1964 in Britain on a slogan which uh, said the Labour Party would uh, reforge Britain in the white heat of the scientific revolution. Mm. Um, uh, so, uh, I think that uh, I think this is important uh, uh, because, uh, among other things, I think it's finding resonance uh, beyond uh, the hexagon. Uh, elsewhere in Europe, among uh, uh, the young people that I speak to from other European countries, and I think uh, uh, we should understand uh, the potential appeal of precisely this. Moreover, I would say that the president is very well equipped to do this. I think, first of all, he understands that politics is ultimately a creative exercise. Uh, uh, unlike uh, the 19th century French deputy Ledru Rollin, after whom the metro stop is named, who uh, said uh, famously, um, uh, these are my people, I am their leader, therefore I must follow them. Uh, well. Uh, Monsieur Macron understands that that's not going to be enough in the current period, uh, even if comparative political economists like me uh, uh, rarely look at the creative side of politics. And uh, secondly, he understands uh, that some of the most important political weapons in this creative politics are symbolic weapons. Maybe um, that's something you would learn as a student of Paul uh, Ricoeur. Uh, in other words, what you say uh, what you say is as important as uh, what you do, uh, um, even if, as you mentioned, diplomats uh, don't necessarily always like this, although I'm sure that you do. Um, so, uh, so I think that's a very important part of the aspirations. That would be my first point. Secondly, um, and uh, I think you made this point uh, very well, uh, it seems to me that uh, to understand uh, the French government today, and particularly President Macron's position, uh, we have to see that he takes the view, I think rightly, that the principal threat to Europe, and uh, might also be said uh, to France, 
comes from uh, this rising Euroscepticism associated with populism of both the left uh, and the right. Uh, so the central challenge is to persuade uh, people, uh, not only those who vote in France, but uh, people elsewhere in Europe, uh, that the European Union is for them uh, rather than against them. And so he advances uh, une certaine idée de l'Europe, uh, in a sense, uh, self-consciously following uh, François Mitterrand, who was himself uh, following de Gaulle uh, in certain ways. And I think it's very striking what that certain idea of Europe is here. It, and it's an idea that, as I read it, that suggests that uh, Europe can be the basis for social protection. It can be the basis for protecting people from the vicissitudes of the contemporary world, as well as a platform for rejuvenating the European economy. And uh, this is very striking. It's striking in part because it marks a sharp break on my reading from uh, past uh, French governments, uh, which, uh, in which many leading politicians have typically run against globalization. As we know, the French are, I think, still the most hostile people to globalization based on the surveys around the world. And that's partly a reflection of a politics which has argued that globalization is an enormous threat to France. Uh, well, uh, it doesn't take a genius to realize that when you talk about globalization, you're also talking about Europeanization and mm -hmm. the European Union. So there's a way in which uh, there, there's been a built-in hypocrisy to French governance for many years in which uh, politicians who were behind closed doors endorsing the initiatives of the EU were in fact running against them uh, on the campaign trail. And I th think in that context, this is a very refreshing break, uh, if not also uh, a necessary one. Uh, that would be my second uh, view of, of the core features of uh, the answer to this question, what is Macron? Uh, and uh, th thirdly, uh, I, uh, here we come to um, the content of uh, what is to be done. And I think there's an interesting uh, dichotomy, if you like, in what the president is proposing. On uh, the one hand, he's proposing a set of initiatives that involve institutional reforms in the European Union. And you mentioned several of them, the creation of a uh, European Ministry of the Economy uh, um, in particular and, and uh, the development of a European budget uh, to support it. And that's one approach. But then there's a second approach, uh, which is a set of very uh, concrete substantive initiatives, uh, which involve setting up an agency for Europe. There are many of them, so I'm not going to go through them all, but setting up an agency for European innovation, uh, harmonizing corporate tax rates in the EU, um, strengthening the borders of the EU and the like. And I think the thing that should be said about that is that uh, the institutional proposals are far less important in my view, than the pragmatic substantive proposals. And they're also, in some sense, much less likely uh, to actually uh, come into being uh, for reasons that uh, we can turn to. Uh, in my view, uh, one of the uh, problems of uh, those who've tried to sustain and revive uh, the European project in uh, recent decades has been their overweening focus on institutional reform, when, in fact, uh, what people want are concrete initiatives, and what the EU is actually more capable of delivering are concrete initiatives. So in that sense, I think there are, it's important to recognize there are two sides. I'd be interested to see if you agree. I think it's important to recognize there are two sides uh, to the Macron project, mm -hmm. and one is ultimately more auspicious uh, than the other. <laughs> well, what about the challenges? And uh, I've got five minutes to talk about challenges, and I'll say something about this. I think there are three that I'd want to underline, uh, and uh, Im implicitly, if not explicitly, these pose some questions uh, to the ambassador. Uh, so the first challenge, I, I think um, the name of the first challenge is East Central Europe. Um, uh, th there is, as we know, an incipient uh, 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 cleavage between uh, Western and Eastern Europe, which turns on uh, the image uh, of Europe in uh, both on both sides of the continent. Uh, we've had many panels here, and some of you may have uh, come to some of them, and you can see that cleavage reflected uh, in what the East Europeans say on those panels. I'm um, stylizing this a little bit, but uh, there are many, many people in Eastern Europe uh, the East Europeans uh, who are in the European Union are very attached to the European Union. Uh, 
But their image of what the European Union should be is really, I think, often quite different than the image that we see in the West, uh, and perhaps not appreciated adequately in the West. I think many Europeans see um, the mission of the EU as one of promoting a certain kind of European civilization, uh, which is uh, Christian and relatively closed and uh, uh, rooted in Enlightenment ideals, although maybe only some Enlightenment <laughs> ideals. Uh, and so in many ways, uh, they argue that the European Union has a, a very important cultural mission. But their image, as I've just implied, of that cultural mission is very different uh, than the image that one would find uh, in the West. And that, I think, uh, provides the grounds for an incipient conflict uh, between the two sides of the continent. Um, um, uh, Timothy Garton-Ash gave a wonderful uh, talk about the EU in this room uh, a few weeks ago, uh, in which, in talking about Poland, a country he knows well, he described Poland as a country that uh, managed to have uh, anti-Semitism without Jews and now manages to have Islamophobia without uh, Muslims. Uh, and uh, that is the basis for uh, a very serious division, as we already know, uh, in the European Union. Well, when we look closely at President Macron's initiatives, we see that uh, under the aegis of a European Union that provides social protection, he's suggesting that corporate taxes should be harmonized. That is to say, countries, their country should not have particularly low tax levels. But that is the economic model on which a number of East European countries, and Ireland, I might add, have actually built their economic prosperity. So it's a fundamental threat on that level, on the economic level. Uh, he's also arguing, and I think it's a great idea, he's also arguing uh, that instead of leveling down, Europe should level up, up. and so uh, there should be arrangements whereby minimum wages, for instance, increase uh, and gradually converge to higher levels across the European Union. Well, you can see that that also uh, threatens to some degree uh, East Central European economic models, as does the initiative on posted workers, which uh, France has just had uh, some success uh, in um, uh, securing. So uh, <clears throat> I, so there's a way in which uh, the first challenge is uh, the challenge posed by the opening of a divide, the deepening of a divide between East and Western uh, Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, second challenge is the one that you mentioned, and I entirely agree with you. Uh, none of us in this room would um, ignore it. And that's uh, the challenge posed by the state of German politics as reflected in the last uh, election. Uh, so uh, President Macron's strategy is built on pushing the ignition switch, turning on the ignition switch for the Franco-German engine, which has long been the basis for European integration. And the question is, is the German half of that engine still firing on all four cylinders? Uh, um, or, or is that an illusion uh, based on the inspection tests that were done um, <laughs> recently? Uh, well, as we all know, this is um, the answer to that question is much less clear after the German election than it was before. The presence of a Jamaica coalition, a red, uh, um, uh, or rather a black, yellow, green coalition, uh, raises the very realistic prospect that the Free Democrats will have the finance ministry, and the Free Democrats are very opposed to fiscal transfers you know, in the EU, et cetera. When I think of a Jamaica coalition, I can't help but think of my favorite Bob Marley song, which is uh, No Woman, No Cry. And uh, I think we'll be seeing that in the German press. Um, uh, so what the proposals that the French president calls for uh, demand is that Germany uh, look beyond narrow national interests, develop, move beyond a narrow view of its national interest, uh, to take a, a view of its national interest that it is infused by uh, Macron's image of the European uh, future. And I think that's not impossible. I don't think we should write off that possibility. Uh, uh, but there's no question that the direction of political pressures, if the direction of political pressures in France uh, call for a president who looks uh, beyond national borders uh, for the national interest, uh, political pressures in Germany are moving in exactly the opposite direction, uh, having to respond now to the alternative in, in the Bundestag uh, and the like. And that takes me to my uh, last point, the um, third challenge that I see here. Uh, and uh, it's in, uh, my views on this are inspired by your remarks about multilateralism. Um, uh, so I think that um, 
multilateralism deserves to be in the DNA of uh, French uh, uh, diplomacy, and even with uh, new techniques for gene splicing, I doubt that it's going to be removed uh, anytime soon. Um, but when I think about my multilateralism, I think about um, the experiences I had going to dances uh, in the school auditorium in high school. I took a multilateral approach uh, to those <laughs> events, which was I was hoping I could find partners uh, to dance with. Um, and that wasn't always successful. And the question has to be, well, is the United States at the moment out smoking in the parking lot? Yeah. And um, there's a real possibility that that is uh, the case. And so the question is, uh, how can one, how does one operate an effect of multilateralism in that context? And associated with that, of course, are the question, and, you know, Britain is not yet out in the parking lot, but nonetheless, it's... Um, it's close. Uh, thinking about it. And so the, and, and the question I think, that some of the interesting questions that emerged from there, and I'll stop with this and uh, hope that you might have something to say about it, is uh, where does China fit into this uh, multilateralism? Uh, is it um, a, a potential partner and perhaps a more plausible partner uh, in the context of uh, current American policies? Um, where, where does Russia fit in? I mean, Russia uh, is key to the Syrian conflict, and France is very uh, involved uh, in seeking resolution to that conflict. Uh, w w w what can we hope for from Russia? What should we be seeking? What should France be seeking from Russia in that um, respect? And uh, if that sounds a little bit pessimistic on the multilateralism front, I'll simply close by saying, uh, going back to Harold Wilson, who's one of my favorite politicians of the 1960s, uh, and his most famous expression was, a week is a long time in politics. Mm -hmm. uh, well, um, f for we Americans, I would say simply that four years is actually a short time in politics. <laughs> and so um, there may be light at the end of the multilateralism tunnel after all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Four years is short, but feels long. Uh, no, anyway. Um, thank you very much for those remarks, Monsieur Raoul. Would you like to reply, or do you prefer? Uh, well, maybe uh, I'm not going to reply to everything because it will be uh, half an hour um, uh, or more. Um, because you know, really, thank you very much for all these remarks, which which are quite relevant. Um, as for, as for the German politics, uh, I think, you know, the President Macron gave an interview to the Spiegel, and uh, actually the interview has been published in English, uh, so I advise you to really to read it, um, especially because he said, one sentence was interesting because um, he, he, he was asked about his proposals, and he, he, he answered, I had uh, presented my proposal to Chancellor Merkel before making them public, and, and she didn't object. It doesn't mean that she endorsed them, but she didn't object. Uh, so let's, let's wait uh, for uh, what will be the German majority. I think, in a sense, Brexit, and uh, you know, I, I've just written Brexit on my paper when you were referring to it, and what is happening in this country is, is a spur, I think, uh, for, for Germany, in a sense, to, to act. Uh, more, you know, to act, uh, to, to, to move forward uh, in terms of European, uh, European affairs. You know, the, the, the German, the Federal German, uh, the, the, the Federal Republic of Germany has been built on the idea of law, the state of law, international law, and, and, and the European also, the European integration. And in a sense, Brexit and some initiatives taken by this administration have really been a, really a shock for, for the Germans. To be frank, I, I've been a bit surprised by some declaration of Chancellor Merkel during the, uh, during the electoral campaign, where she was extremely critical uh, of the British and the American policies in terms I was not used to, or we were not used to, in, in terms of, of German, uh, German politics. So I think there is in Germany the feeling uh, that something very important is happening towards the, liberal, the, the world liberal order, mm -hmm. uh, an order based on, on the rule of law, and that Germany has to shoulder its part of responsibility to preserve this order. So maybe I'm too, I go too far. 
I think we have to wait for for uh, for the constitution of the German government. Uh, at the end of the day, of course, uh, in a sense, uh, President Macron will not get everything he, 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 he wants or everything he has put on the table. So there will be a compromise. But I do think that on, on, on Germany, in Germany, there is a strong sense that uh, Germany is the third or the f- fourth um, the fourth uh, economic world power, and that Germany has some responsibilities uh, in in our in our times. But again, uh, I think uh, uh, China and Russia. It's uh, it's interesting also because the feeling that we all have is basically uh, since I've written on the. First World War, that we are more or less back to 1914. Not because we have a world war ahead of us, but because we are in a, in a world where power politics is back. Mm. Power politics is back. The way it was uh, managed uh, by Bismarck and, and, and so on. Um, and, uh, and China and Russia are playing this game. And for the Europeans, uh, in a sense, uh, it's a uh, it's it's a tough uh, uh, waking up call, mm. uh, and and we have the impression that we are uh, the only adult uh, left, <laughs> and that we have to try to save uh, to save this world order uh, to which you know we are we are deeply committed. So uh, we are not naive, you know. Really, what happened in uh, in Crimea, what hap- what is happening in the South China Sea. Uh, shows that uh, this power politics is is, is back and uh, it has dire consequences. Uh, but again, we consider that with the Europeans, uh, we should do our utmost uh, to to save what is possible to save. I should add, in terms of China, that you may have noticed that uh, when uh, when the president has announced that the U.S. were withdrawing from the Paris Agreement. Uh, China has taken the high moral ground, uh, uh, uh. and and China has, is uh, uh, is presenting itself as the defender of the world order <laughs> of multilateralism and and so on. You could consider on one side, you could consider that it's 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 a good PR, uh, but uh, at the same time, you can say also that China becoming a world power. Uh, China depending on 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 the trade on uh, trade for for its growth, and China having growth problems in terms of hundreds of millions of Chinese who are still extremely poor, and that's really the the, the growth is the ma- major major priority of any uh, Chinese authority. So that China has an interest in a sense to uphold uh, the the world order uh, because it's necessary for. Uh, for the future of the economy, which means the future of the country, of the regime, and, and, and so on. So, as for Central Europe, I think it's, it goes beyond, uh, beyond Macron. You know, it's really, uh, in a sense, we are back to the problem of populism and activism. Uh, so, it's, uh, we have to, to, uh, um, to find a way of, uh, of ending uh, uh, this crisis. Um, in a sense, we maybe we were too optimistic because we we could uh, argue we could say that we have been extremely successful. You know, between 1990 and 2017, the way largely the European Union has succeeded to bring the economies of these countries, you know, from where they, they were in mm. 1990 to where they are to get today, and in a, in, a, in a democratic framework. Maybe we had underestimated actually uh, what was remaining from. Uh, 40 years of communism and before, actually, for most of these countries, uh, decades and centuries of authoritarian regime. Maybe we had underestimated and that maybe the the ghosts are back. The Mm. ghosts of the past are back. Uh, So there there are several, really basically several ways of moving forward. Basically, to find compromise with this uh, with these countries, you know, really because the issues which are at stake, as you have said, are largely symbolic or cultural, uh, you know, and um, we can also, uh, in a sense, 
use the majority power, the power of majority, if we have the majority in the European Union, or we could try, uh, work, and that's that. There, these countries are really worried about it, trying to work in smaller circles. You know that in the European Union treaty, it's possible to make, you know, really that's a few countries which want to move uh, to move further and more quicker than uh, the more rapidly than the other countries, they can create a, a smaller or smaller circle. And of course, these countries don't like it, you know, because it's a way of exclude them. So again, that's that will be certainly one of the of the of the challenges that the, the president is 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 uh, is going to face. Last point, because I want to let everybody to ask questions. I think there is, uh, when you say a new generation, I, I think um, f the French have changed. I, I really, uh, in a sense, when you are a foreign, uh, when you are a diplomat, a French diplomat living abroad, uh, you have a vision of your own country, maybe uh, from as an insider and outsider at the same time. Uh, you go to your country uh, uh, two or three times a year. Uh, you talk to the taxi driver. Uh, mm -hmm. You suddenly you see that the taxi driver usually now is much younger than he was. That usually is from Maghrebian origin, and uh, actually it's much ni he's much nicer than the previous one. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you go to the restaurants and suddenly you have waiters who are smiling. Uh, really, the country is changing in a sense, you know, you know, everybody knows these statistics. In 1990, 20% uh, of the, the French leaving an engineering school wanted to create uh, a, new, uh, a new business, 20%. Today is 60%. Uh, all the all the polls, all the statistics show that the major ambition of the young French out of the school system is not anymore to become a civil servant, mm -hmm. which is a disaster. Because, but uh, and they really want to go to the private sector. Mm -hmm. uh, so there is a creative. And when you go to when you go to Paris again, it's 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 a bit uh, of course superficial. There is a new energy in the in mm -hmm. the country. Uh, uh, there is the really there is a new generation of French, in a sense, because they went through the uh, through the crisis, the economic crisis, the the, the 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 difficulties in the in the country. So they are more combative, more creative. Uh, I think that uh, and what was interesting is that in the political in the political uh, meet, you know uh, gathering of of Emmanuel Macron, the people were quite young, mm. and they were. And that's interesting. There were also among among them, there were uh, 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 French Arabs, you know, who went to the political meetings of Emmanuel Macron. And, and you know, these people feel excluded from the political life of, of my country. So it was also something which was striking. Uh, you re I remember, I remind you that actually on this issue, Macron was by far the most liberal yeah. in a sense that he said in terms of uh, the, the veil, you know, the law about, uh, he said, okay, we stop here. What we have done is enough. We are not going to move forward. Where, when, while a lot of the other candidates, uh, actually majority of the other candidates wanted to, for instance, to forbid, uh, you know, the, ve the veil, the, the Islamic veil everywhere in the public space and so on and so on. And he said, no, we stop here. And, and so again, I do think that there is something, maybe it could, it could go, to, go to nowhere, you know, really, but there is a new feeling in, in, uh, uh, in France, and maybe that the young French will deny it, actually saying, no, no, we want to become ambassadors. So, <laughs> you know, <yeah. laughs> All right, thank you very much. So, um, yes, um, we'll move to... Questions from the audience. I want to let you know that there are microphones in the ceiling that pick up your voice for the recording, but do not amplify your voice in the room. So if you could please, when you speak, project so that um, Mr. Ahul can hear you. Um, we'd appreciate it. And also, please identify yourselves. Uh, yes, the young woman here in the front. Yes, yeah, right, right there. Yes, the one who's turning around. You. <laughs> Please introduce yourself. Hi, uh, Your Excellency. Uh, no, not Your Excellency. Ambassador. Please, please. Uh, I really admire you for the tweets that you posted. Uh, very uh, lot of courage after the election of Donald Trump. Uh, so I'm a student. I'm a former student of Polytechnic. Uh, coming to the US was a dream for me. Uh, I have two separate questions. So the first one is about 
about the Paris Agreement and the U.S. withdrawal from that. Uh, so you spoke of clubs, European of, of uh, European countries to counterbalance the, the international possible withdrawal <laughs> because it's a non-binding agreement. Uh, so if you can maybe elaborate on that and, and let me know about your uh, feelings about COP23 and uh, about the. Um, the conference that will take place in Paris in December, the previous morning. So this is my first question. And the second question, uh, so you, you spoke about sitting together and, and building space uh, for discussion. Um, coming to the US for me has been a dream and a nightmare <laughs> for different reasons that I'm not going to detail here, but I'm happy to report, to make a report to you more detailed. Um, are you willing to build infrastructures that would allow the weakest people, the weakest, the weakest French people here, to feel that there is a rule of law uh, as a foreigner here, uh, and um, to prevent uh, the, 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 the feeling of impunity and, and of not being heard? I'm happy to, to detail more my... my yeah, yeah, I don't understand. <laughs> No, um, no, first, I think uh, this lady was referring to a tweet which really nearly uh, um, was, uh, you know, the day uh, I was at 8 p.m. on, 8, uh, 6 p.m. on the 8th of November, you know, basically I called, uh, I called the Clinton campaign and they said we are elected. I called the two major uh, pollsters, a Republican and Democrat, Democrat, they said she is elected. I called uh, the, the Trump campaign and they said, oh, we have one, one chance out of five to win. After that, there was the night, you remember? So at 3 a.m. in the morning, you know, we had the result. And actually, uh, my, I made a tweet we, have, we had some consequences for me, <laughs> actually, which was, uh, it was a mistake. Uh, but it was not criticizing Trump. You know, it was basically saying in French, uh, really, after Brexit, after Trump, a world has collapsed. And it was a way of saying, Really, something is happening in our Western democracies. I didn't care about Trump, frankly. I was thinking of my own country and the elections coming. It has been interpreted as, and again, I, I, as a critic, criticizing the president, uh, the elect president, and I had all the far right in France, you know, really uh, sending me hundreds of uh, messages of threat, homophobic. It was awful. It was terrible. So really, so it was uh, actually it was a mistake, and I wanted simply to say because I was devastated. Not in again, I'm not American. It, it was for me. It was more problem was what is coming in my country now. It's obvious that there is a wave throughout our democracies. What is coming, and I couldn't really think of Macron again at the time. Nobody would believe that Macron had any chance of of getting elected. You know, as for the climate change. What I have told my authorities after the decision which was announced by President Trump was it's not that important. Uh, it's not that important because uh, actually uh, I have, you know, before the 2015 uh, uh, climate change conference, the COP21, I've been traveling uh, uh, extensively in, the, in this country and I have felt that actually the U.S., once you cross the Beltway, uh, the U.S. are committed to fighting climate change. You know, <coughs> all the cities, you can say, well, okay, all the cities are, are Democrats, but all the cities are, are on board, but also all the major companies. You know, really, Walmart is really, and Walmart is not for tattoo deep stairs. <laughs> you know, really, uh, Walmart, uh, De the Coca-Cola, Delta Airlines, and so on. You know, I met dozens of CEOs, and all of them said, we are on board, and we want to come to Paris. We want to, 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 be, to, be, to be there. Mm -hmm. uh, I visited also a laboratory, and I can tell you, the tech, this country, as you know, is, is inventive, uh, scientifically uh, magnificent, and the technology is there, or very close to be there. Your country, the U.S., if you are American, the country, you know, is a mine for renewable energy. When you look at the Midwest with the wind, you know, you know, 30 percent of the electricity of Iowa, which, which is not the most liberal state in the U.S., actually is provided by the wind. 30 percent. Oklahoma, there are 20 percent. So you have the wind in the Midwest. You have the sun in the, in the West. Uh, and again, in terms of technology, 
we are very close to be uh, to be there. The coal has not been killed by uh, uh, the so-called Obama regulations; has been killed by the shale uh, by the shale gas. So I think that. Uh, we have to work with the Americans on climate change. We have to work with the mayors. We have to work with the governors. We have to work with, with the major companies. And as I've, I was trying to explain on, in December, the idea of the president is the, to mobilize the finance. And you can't speak about finance without referring to New York, to the place of New York. So there, and when you talk to the major uh, hedge funds or, or major, uh, you know, to uh, Goldman Sachs, Bank of America, you, you see that they have already investment funds in green, uh, green investment funds. Uh, that they are not going to invest. For instance, Goldman Sachs is not going to invest anymore in coal. Uh, in coal, you know, really. So. Again, the, this country is, is moving forward, and, and I really do hope that we will be able, in Paris in December, to, to tell the, the, the poorest country we will have the $100 billion. You, have, you, are, you are really fulfilling your part of the deal, your national commitments, and, and we, on our side, we will help you. Uh, we will help you today. Frankly, I'm quite optimistic about the U.S. and climate change. I'm, I'm, I'm sure that, you know, I know, I feel it, that this country is, is, is really on board. Uh, that's a relief uh, to hear. Oh, my goodness. Art Goldhammer, um, Steve Gallant next, and then we'll open up further. Okay. Well, uh, thank you for your very, very eloquent uh, description of Macronism. Uh, my question takes off from Peter Hall's perceptive remarks about the challenges that uh, Macron will face in uh, uh, bringing his vision uh, for the future of Europe to fruition. Um, as you rightly emphasize, the EU is at the center of his proposals. Uh, and my question really is uh, how you see the opposition to that vision evolving. Uh, Peter uh, mentioned the cleavage between East and West Europe. Uh, a number of Macron's moves seem to have been designed to deepen that cleavage. Hmm. Uh, he made a a speech, a very harsh speech about Poland uh, very early in his presidency, which uh, provoked some sharp remarks from the Polish. The victory in the posted workers uh, matter uh, also antagonized Poland and several other countries in Eastern Europe. Uh, and you mentioned the uh, uh, European, uh, the, the practice in, uh, in the past in the European Union of uh, creating small groups of countries that move forward at a more rapid pace than others. And uh, so my question to you is, Macron uh, deliberately trying to provoke this opposition so that uh, he and like-minded uh, countries, uh, like uh, like-minded uh, leaders like uh, Merkel, can move forward and leave the others behind? Is mm -hmm. this a deliberate strategy to uh, create this cleavage? Uh, and then the, the second part of the question is how you see, perhaps you'll be more reluctant to respond to this, how you see the domestic opposition uh, evolving. The next major national election is the European election, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and uh, uh, as you rightly point out, Macron found a new, uh, he, he has remade the French political landscape by finding an opportunity in the center. This has left the traditional parties devastated, uh, created uh, a, a new opposition on the far left, and uh, divided the old center-left party, which may now forge an alliance with the Front National. Uh, both of those oppositions will be anti-EU. Uh, so if Macron is unable to deliver uh, on, uh, uh, if the protective EU that he is promising uh, does not bring the protections that are promised, uh, do you think that will uh, lead to a defeat in the European Union elections? Well, by definition, I, I, I really, I, I don't know. <laughs> For on the lot. No, first, I, I want to emphasize, in a sense, several points, which I think are related to, to, to the questions which have been raised. And um, first, uh, Macron himself. Uh, people forget that uh, behind is, uh, you know, really that this young guy, uh, sexy with uh, uh, slim suits, actually, as you were referring to, is an intellectual. You know, he has been the assistant of the, the, the really, the, the better, really the, the biggest French philosopher. 
And, and when you read these interviews to the Spiegel or, uh, or to uh, Le Point or, you know, or also, you know, he gave an interview to the um, uh, a magazine of philosophy in France, you know, really. <laughs> and you see that actually he's trying to conceptualize what is he doing, you know, really. So that's, you know, is again, he's, uh, he's an intellectual, uh, he's French, but also a real intellectual. <laughs> he's, trying, he's trying to really to, to, to conceptualize. And when I met him several times, and, and really, uh, I, I, I felt it. He's extremely, he's extremely smart. But I don't want to look as a, as a fan. Um, the, the second element, as I've said, um, in France, as for the, 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 polit- the political landscape has been totally... Uh, uh, changed. Uh, the traditional political parties are, are devastated. Uh, but even, you know, even the Front National is going through a deep crisis. You know, really, in a sense, it has changed its policy. He has, they have made a campaign which was basically anti-EU and only anti-EU. So they have, they have right now, they have shifted to be back to their, you know, the, 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 their usual ideas against uh, uh, immigration and, and more pro-nativist position. But uh, you feel it. There is a doubt on the far right because she was so bad uh, in the in the debate against Macron that there is a doubt about her ability of 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 being a good a good candidate. Uh, the Socialist Party was the governing party has disappeared, has vanished. You know, really, basically today, uh, it will come back. You know, really, but it means there a lot that even they've they've given up their name. They are selling their their building. You know, really, it's. Uh, you suddenly you have this far far left uh, which is uh, e- emerging, and you have this party, this new centrist party, where you are uh, you are wondering whether it's it's really an accident, whether it will last uh, six months, five years, or twenty years. Nobody can, may know, and. Also, the, the Conservative Party also is, uh, has lost an election that shouldn't have been lost because everybody would have, would have a bet on the victory of the Conservative. Uh, and they feel obliged to go to the right because, in a sense, Macron is also, you know, really filling a space. And in terms of economic policy, you can say that it's a center of the right government. So, you know, really, so everybody for the moment is trying to find, uh, uh, you know, really uh, in a sort of puzzle, political puzzle, really to find uh, where, where they are. So I don't know what will be the, the political, uh, political future, what will be the future of the presidential party, for instance. You know, as I've said, 78% of new members of parliament, a lot of them are uh, clumsy, a lot of them made mistakes, but other, other ones will, will emerge. Uh, you know, you, you, you need time. We need time to know uh, uh, really all these new figures. You know, really, uh, uh, you are not, nobody is able, I'm sure, to give the names of the ministers and to try to describe from where they are coming. You know, it, and again, in the French system, it's quite unheard. You know, really, the people are around for 20 years, you know, from Minister of Transportation to Health, from Health to, and so on. And that, there are, new, there are new people coming from the civil society. So there is a lot, a lot of question mark. The president has been an extraordinary strategist. He has strategized his campaign, you know, from, from the beginning, uh, and he has won. Uh, but at the same time, he has no political experience. Really, and the people around him have no political experience. So you have also to give, you know, really to expect, really, uh, what you can consider as mistake or really. And uh, so it's again, we are in, a, we are in a really in a, a totally new ground, uh, breaking new ground. And I can't tell you what will be uh, where France will be in six months or where it will be in in, in one year. It's new. Uh, and I'm actually I'm quite excited for once to have a new uh, a new political life in my in my country in my country. You know, I had a minister of foreign affairs uh, who told, who said, uh, you know, he was minister of foreign affairs. He said, you know, I was prime minister 30 years ago. <laughs> Try to imagine, you know, really. And he was minister of, of foreign affairs. I don't give his name, but you can guess. <laughs> you know, really, it's. Uh, um, okay. Steve, go on. Did you have a question? No? I'm sorry. Did you have a question? I, I do. Yeah. Uh, Please introduce yourselves. Yes, uh, Bob Rosenberg. I'm sorry, I got the wrong person. But that's... Uh, I uh, am both in the business world and also advise on policy issues. 
if, if you were to stand up and speak loudly, in fact, if everyone were, this would help people in the back who can't really yeah, hear. Yeah, they can't hear. Yes. Uh, Bob Rosenberg, and I'm both in the business world and also advise on policy issues. And uh, so I'm pleased that you're here in Boston giving this talk. Um, I could ask the easy questions, but that's no fun. Uh, the difficult question is what's happening, as has been pointed out by a number of people here on the panel as well as others. But what's happening around the world in terms of as you put it, power politics, the question of people getting up in stands and making terrible comments uh, about people not like themselves. Uh, we've had uh, here in the US two former presidents who have gone out of the way to make uh, speeches about the importance of keeping this country as a democracy. And I don't think that we can take for granted that what we've had in the last uh, years since uh, World War II, that we uh, automatically have democracies. Uh, how, what is your view about this, and what do you think that uh, Europe and France can do uh, to uh, deal with this problem? After all, we've seen, we've seen uh, moments in history where uh, people uh, such as that I referred to uh, pop up and they become bigger movements than what we expect and horrible results uh, come to it and I'm not just talking about World War II but you can look throughout history uh, so um, what you see that Europe could do and France could do Thank you very much. Actually, you know, I'm going to publish an article about the fall of the Roman Empire. So I don't know if it's, if it's relevant to your question. Um, I, you know, I, and of course, it's a way for me to avoid, uh, to avoid answering to your question. But, <laughs> uh, but and I'm sure that I'm going to shock some of yours, some of you. Uh, the fact is that I um, don't think that the foreign policy followed by the present administration is that different from the foreign policy followed by President Obama. And I know that it's a shock, uh, but actually what was, a, what was for, for an outsider, what was striking in the President Obama's foreign policy was a reluctance to engage the U.S. Uh, into uh, foreign adventures after the George W. Bush uh, foreign policy, there was even a will to disengage quickly. You remember that the American forces rushed out of Iraq in 2011, and, and they were on the point of rushing out of Afghanistan. Um, and, and you have seen major crises like the Ukrainian crisis or the Syrian crisis, where actually the Americans basically really had a policy of benign neglect. Try to imagine the crisis of Ukraine that was outsourced to France and Germany. Mm -hmm. I don't know any example of a crisis in the uh, of a major crisis since 1945, uh, and it was a major crisis with Russia invading a country, uh, annexing a country, uh, feeding the civil war, uh, and not far from really uh, um, allies, and basically. Uh, we, we were, uh, the French and the Germans, we were really, really said, okay, you solved the, the issue, we support you, but you solved, the, you, 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 you handled the issue with the, and, and in Syria, it's the same. So I do think that there is, and uh, I was discuss, discussing that with uh, actually a, 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 a democratic member of the Congress, uh, elected in California, so, and, uh, and we were discussing this issue that beyond the Beltway, out of the think tanks community in Washington where everybody is on the right neoconservative and on the left liberal interventionist, there is this, in this country a wariness about international commitments. Mm -hmm. And I think the President Obama felt it. And in a sense, in his own way, uh, President Trump also does. And... Uh, that's my personal analysis, but I was, I was struck by, by this uh, very young, actually, he's a freshman uh, on the House and uh, coming from one of the most liberal uh, constituency in the, in the country, uh, which was really uh, a feeling that, actually, yes, the Americans are fed up with, with international uh, interventions yeah. and that we, we should look at, at what is 
at really what are our, our problems. So you have on one side, in a sense, uh, you know, people say, oh, we had the liberal order. Actually, the liberal order was the Western order, was the order that we were dominating, and which was dominated by the U.S. and, secondly, by its allies. Uh, the fact is that there is a new balance of power. And basically, because, you know, Russia is back and China is emerging and uh, Brazil, Brazil, it's a bit different. But uh, De Gaulle was saying Brazil is a country of the future, which will remain so. <laughs> so really, it's uh, so Brazil, India and so on. So we have a more balanced country, a more balanced system. Uh, in, in terms of, of power. So it's, it's really, we are back in a sort of power politics in terms of balance between different, uh, different powers. So the US is, uh, and we are facing this, this reality, but we are facing it also with on the side of the US, I think, again, I don't know if the next president will, will be on the same line, but I think there is in this country, out of Washington DC, uh, there is also, a temptation to say, okay, let these people solve their own problems. And I think the Europeans are, are realizing it. And they are realizing it also because the problems are much closer to their borders. Uh, in terms, not only of Syri in the Syrian crisis, but with the consequence on terrorism, mm -hmm. the migrations. You know, actually, we, the problem uh, in migrations. Um, uh, Actually, I wrote my article about the fall of the Roman Empire because the Prime Minister of the Netherlands uh, launched his campaign uh, in 2015 for um, campaign by saying, in terms of migration, we are facing the same threat that the Roman Empire. <laughs> well, whoa, <laughs> really, and uh, he was he, he had to defeat the far right, and actually he did. Uh, so, the population, you know, right now, half of the children. Uh, less than five years old are African. You know, the population, as I've said, of the Sahel countries is doubling every 18 years, and so on, and all the figures are there. Um, uh, so, obviously, uh, Europe is uh, facing an immediate problem, and, and uh, it means also that we have to engage with our African uh, friends, we have to, to contribute to their uh, the, the, the growth to the really and uh, so in a sense the Europeans also they they can't disengage really they, they they can't disengage I think the U.S. can't either but in a sense the temptation is 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 I think is is easier so we are in this in this period of transition of uh, what will be the American policy in the midterm for what will be the because again two presidents, it's not enough. What will be uh, the policy of the American policy in, a, in the four years, in eight years, or in 12 years? I don't know. Uh, but it's, it's sure that the Europeans should. I don't know, I'm not sure that they will, but they should go back to history. Um, because, we, you know, the end of history, I think for the, lot, the end of history for the Fukuyama was at least, everybody says he was wrong, but unfortunately, I think it was right for some European countries. There are some European countries uh, which basically have considered that they could really basically live a comfortable life in their corner of the world. You know, really everything was fine. Social security was working and they would, there was no immediate threat. So you, the Europeans have to awake, to be awake, to say, actually, yes, the, the threats are back. And, and we are all on the, same, on the same boat, which is not the case. The French, uh, the Spanish, the Italians, for obvious reasons, consider, you know, say what is happening in the Sahel is quite important. When you go to Scandinavia, no. And so it's, at the same time, the Poles will say what is happening in Russia is important. So we have also uh, to be fair, fair to the Poles also, to take into account their, uh, their, their, their legitimate worries. But we do. Actually, there are French soldiers in Estonia now. Uh, so we do. But we have also, but we have to convince our European friends that we need to have a foreign policy because the threats, again, the threats and are very diverse, the threats are, are back. Okay, gentleman back here. Yes, you. Thank you. Um, I'm Richard Rosen. I work on the economics of mitigating climate change. So I'd like to return to the issue of uh, the uh, financial needs to do so. Um, 
frankly, uh, I'm very glad, of course, that the Paris Agreement was signed, but I hope people, at least in this room, know that the commitment so far to invest in mitigating climate change won't get us anywhere near the two degree uh, level. That will be three degrees or so, which is huge. Um, already you might have seen the article in the New York Times this morning on people in southern India having to choose whether to move away from their villages or not because it's getting so hot and dry. So frankly, um, from the point of view of, of research, $100 billion a year, which was committed to help uh, poorer countries uh, mitigate climate change is trivial. It's, it's far too small. And, and of course, you're having trouble raising even that. Uh, some of us believe that it would take at least uh, uh, a trillion or two just for poor countries uh, a year to, to get on the right path. So my question is, is there any fallback position in the French government to try to ratchet up the level and the way in which uh, finance could actually be obtained for poor countries to mitigate climate change? Uh, is there any <laughs> plan B to, to do better? My God, we are we are trying to save the agreement, so we are not, uh, you know, hatching it up, as you say. No, it's um, you know the the philosophy behind uh, the the Paris Agreement, behind what we have been doing, uh, is first um, really basically uh, all the countries are realizing that climate change is a challenge, and. Frankly, to have ever, all the countries signatories of this agreement was quite a thing. And right now, there are only one country which is not signatory, which is Syria, and one country which is living, but is still in the agreement, which is the US. So it was something, you know, it was the, the first time that everybody around the table say, that's something that we have to, to handle. The second element, as I have said, is the states they are not only the states, you have always, you have also the, the cities, the, the territories, the companies, and so on. The third element, and that's, that's very strange coming from the French, it's an optimistic assessment of what is going to happen. And it's the first time I see the French diplomacy being optimistic about the future. Uh, basically, uh, we are convinced that looking at the technology and looking at the, feel, the feeling of, of urgency that actually when there would be these peer reviews, because you know we have per periodic peer reviews, uh, the, there will be the ambitions that you are referring to, actually we will be able to be more ambitious. Uh, we do think that we are going, first we are going to create a sort of virtual circle. Uh, we do think that the, 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 cons the pressure of the, what is happening will also mobilize more the countries and that now there is a, we have reached a point, you know, basically, where everybody says, okay, we have to do something, but it's in the future that will come, uh, in a sense, uh, what is the most important, the concrete realization, and we, we wanted to create a momentum. And that after that, when we are going to look at uh, the, uh, the technology, when also people are going to realize that actually fighting climate change is creating jobs, is creating opportunities that will be, uh, uh, the momentum will increase and uh, we will go into your direction. But again, that's uh, a bet. I'm uh, really, I do think that in Paris, uh, we, could go, we couldn't go uh, further. You know, really, and uh, really it's, uh, it's very funny because uh, at the last moment uh, in Paris, uh, you know, the, for the American delegation, it was quite important that it doesn't appear as um, a binding agreement. So they do really, and suddenly the, the Americans di the discover that there was in the text, I, I usually I always make the mistake, there was a shawl instead of the should or should instead of the shawl. I don't remember what shouldn't be there. And they came to, just at the moment, at the final moment, they came to the French president saying, we can't, we can't stop everything, we can't, because again, it's sure it should be should. And the French president said, just with the, the hammer, say, uh, there is only a, a small fix, it will be should instead of sure. Agreed. <laughs> <laughs> and the agreement was, was agreed, so really. Okay. Oh, my goodness. Um, gentlemen here. Mm. Yes. yes, you. Yeah. Uh, I have a question about the euro. Mm. Please introduce yourself. Oh, sorry. Uh, I'm Regis really Silva. I'm a faculty member and also an alum of the Kennedy School of Um uh, You alluded to this, but at the heart of 
a lot of the problems with the EU is money. And the fight with Greece, for example, mm. is over this issue. Uh, in, in every dem democratic country, fiscal policy is in the hands of the elected representatives, parliament or Congress in this case, in our country. And monetary policy is in the hands of the Fed or the central bank. Mm. Now in Europe, you have a structural problem in that the ECB sets monetary policy, but nobody sets fiscal policy. Or at least, supposedly, there should be some unifying mm. voice. So you have the Greek crisis, and it's likely to happen again. So what is your um, projection for the future in terms of the integrity of the euro and whether it will survive? No, it's it's exactly the as I've as, as I've tried to say uh, that. I, I suspect that for, for the president, for Macron, the, the, the challenge is we are, as I've said, we are in the middle of the stream. We have a monetary union without uh, uh, an economic union, an economic union which would, of course, mean a parliamentary control. So let's move forward to have uh, an European budget, an European minister, uh, um, an European minister, which means, of course, that there will be a uh, responsibility of the European Parliament. There will be, uh, you know, it will be a political authority in a democratic system. Uh, that will be, uh, in a sense, the, the, uh, the goal, it's the goal, the, the goal of the president. I'm not sure that he will, he will reach this point, but it's where he wants, uh, in a sense, it's where he wants to go. If you have a, a, a sort of a, a budget, a significant budget, because uh, as, I've, as you know, for the moment, uh, in a sense, the responsibility of the fiscal uh, policy is the national parliaments, because fiscal policy is, is, is large, is national. So it will be if there is a transfer uh, of several points of the GDP towards an European budget, uh, it means a minister and it means a, 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 parliamentary, a, a parliamentary control, you know. Fiscal policy, it's one of the challenges that, you know, was, uh, was emphasized uh, because we have the problem of this, uh, you know, Basically, you are referring to the Eastern European countries. For us, the real problem, in a sense, is Ireland. You know, Ireland and Luxembourg, mm -hmm. you know, really, uh, which raised the issue also, which will be a major issue, and I suspect it could become an issue between Europeans and Americans, of the big, big internet companies. You know, Apple, basically, Apple is uh, uh, incorporated in Ireland. Uh, so all the profits are, are channeled to Apple Ireland. And in Ireland, Apple has negotiated an agreement with the Irish government, a specific agreement about taxation, that two years ago, uh, Apple paid 0.005% of its profits in Europe. Uh, really, of course, it's not politically acceptable, but the Irish say, it's my sovereignty. I can do, I can do. And the commission... You know, it's very shrewd, and I don't know if the European Court of Justice will support the Commission. The Commission has said that's uh, an illegal subsidy to a company. You know, because the Commission couldn't argue about taxation, so they argue about it's, uh, it's an, uh, an illegal subsidy to a private company and, uh, and ask uh, Apple to pay $13 billion, and I don't know why they didn't want. And <laughs> so everything is going to the European Court of Justice. But fiscal, fiscal harmonization will be the art of the discussion, and it will be tough. It will be extremely tough. You know, the Irish are going to fight uh, for their, uh, for their tax, uh, really sovereignty and, and so on. Okay. Um, what I'm going to do now is collect th three. One? One or two. Okay, sorry. Um, one or two questions. So how about in the maroon turtleneck in the back and uh, the green also in the back? So please introduce yourself. Uh, hi, I'm Johan Amel. I'm an Eastern student from Sciences Po at Boston University. And actually, I'm one of a few who still want to be a civil servant. <laughs> uh, but I, I do have a question on the theme of European defense. Uh, you talked about Ukraine before and Ukraine, Ukraine crisis before and how uh, we're a bit left alone to deal with that. And so my question would be, where do we go in terms of European defense from that point forward? And also related to NATO, how do we still cooperate with NATO while still creating on the side a sort of European defense policy, which would be coherent in a way? Thank you. 
Okay, last question. No, Sir? Okay, yeah, Jay Gleason. The uh, impasse in uh, Western Sahara has dragged on now for over 40 years. Uh, Morocco refuses to recognize the World Court decision or hold a referendum. France has done, defended everything that they've done. Uh, you yourself have uh, issued a veto at the UN Security Council. No. A human, no, no. A human rights. Uh, no, no, no. To the no we never, we never opposed the veto. There was no veto. The last veto by France was in 1976 on uh, on the Comoros. No, that I know that there was an article saying that France opposed the veto. We never, we know, we didn't. So, do, do you defend uh, Morocco's position? Uh, I'm, I'm going to answer to your oh, question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, on first on defense, you know, I I was with my um, colleagues from NATO actually uh, at the. On the hill yesterday, and we met the people on the on the on the two on the, in the two cham chambers, and speaking about uh, one and one of the, que the your question was one of the question which was uh, of course raised. First, NATO is uh, a, has a critical role in terms of uh, common defense, uh, very clearly, and uh, and we are all uh, committed to NATO, and especially countries like uh, uh, our Eastern European countries, because they are facing. Uh, a very specific threat. Uh, so that's that really. At the same time, what we have said is uh, by being more active as Europeans, uh, you know, uh, in a sense, we are reinforcing uh, NATO because it's uh, in a way we are not obliged to rush to the Americans every time that there is a shotgun in our neighborhood. You know, really, basically, when we have uh, uh, problems uh, in in, uh, in Africa or elsewhere, uh, you know, we can, we have to handle our own uh, our own business. And if uh, if I'm right on the idea that there is in this country a wariness towards foreign engagement, I think it's much it's all the more important for us uh, to do the job when we can do the job. Uh, but uh, we, our commitment to NATO uh, remains the same. Uh, we have, uh, um, since af after 2018, the, the French government is going to increase the defense budget uh, towards the goal of the 2% of GDP. I can tell you the relationship, the military relationship between France and the U.S. is right now uh, incredible. It, it has never been so intense. Uh, and, uh, you know, I had, uh, I love this story because I think two days ago, the ambassador of the UK told me, he said, oh, you are going, you are doing a, a very great job. Every time a, a British military is meeting the Americans, they say that the French are magnificent. <laughs> I loved it. <laughs> I loved it. <laughs> so as for us, for the Western Sahara, uh, you know, basically uh, in Western Sahara, um, you have uh, this conflict, and and uh, Morocco is not going to to give up the, the Western Sahara. That's that's a fact. Uh, Mar Morocco is not going to give up the Western Sahara. So what we have chosen as a policy is not to try to get a goal which is not going to be reached. Really, uh, that's it's not. You know, we have never approved the fact that Morocco has occupied the Western Sahara. We have never approved it. We have never recognized it. But it's a fact. And fortunately, foreign policy is handling facts. And uh, so they are there. So what was our policy? Uh, and it was very effective. And I, I know it because I was responsible of it after 2010, was uh, to encourage the, 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 the Moroccans uh, actually to improve the situation of the human rights in, in, in the Western Sahara. And, and actually, the Moroccans have taken uh, all a series of, of actions uh, in Western Sahara, uh, creating, you know, uh, uh, institutions, uh, Council of, of Human Rights, and uh, uh, and, and taking uh, concrete actions to improve the situation. You know, I, I have, you know, I think it was in 2013 or 2013, you know, uh, one day um, the an ambassador came to me and said, I, I'm I, I, uh, enough with the, the French obstruction. I'm going to table a text creating uh, a human rights uh, dimension in the UN force. And you, the French, you'll see. And I said, oh, you, you can go, move forward. You know, really, we, the French, we, we don't object, do it. The day after, Morocco was cutting all its relations with this country. The day after, Morocco was saying, if you move forward, we expel the force. And what do you know this country did? Of course, they, the country caved in. The country suddenly realized that it was a red line, and it was a red red line by the Moroccans. You can consider their rank. Well, that's the, that's the real world. 
Unfortunately, you know, really, we have we are trying to handle a real a real world situation. So what we are trying to do is to improve the situation in concrete terms on the ground, even if the result is not the result that we would have wanted. But we think we have the evidence, and it was given by to this country. Uh, that we have the evidence that uh, when you try to move to go further, it doesn't work. So that's really, uh, again, it's, I, I really, I know there is a lot of passion, a lot of, around this, uh, around this issue, uh, people taking side. In this sense, we are not taking side. We are trying to look at what is possible and to do our utmost within the range of what is, uh, what is possible. All right. Well, thank you very much, Your Excellency. That was a very engaging.